welcome everybody uh, to our Auto Friday of the week. Our speaker today is a fellow Latin American. He is Mexican and Brazilian. Uh, and uh, he is Professor Camilo Ruiz. He's an associate professor at the Salamanca University at the Instituto de Física Fundamental e Matemáticas and also faculty of education. He is a physicist, uh, graduated from the UNAM in Mexico City. He got his PhD at the Salamanca University in strong field laser interactions with few body systems, and then went for a postdoc at the Max Planck Institute for Complex Systems in Dresden, and later on at Imperial College. So he was, yeah, he was in London here uh, briefly. Actually, uh, I think it was when I was coming more or less as well. And he got a Ramon y Cajal Fellowship to return to Spain, where he helped to found the CLPU, one petawatt laser center in Salamanca, and the L2A2 50 terawatt laser lab in Santiago de Compostela. His current research interests are auto second science, laser driven, laser driven plasma climate change. So it's good to see when physicists have a conscience and don't think uh, physics is uh, happening in a vacuum. And congratulates, uh, I congratulate him for that. And uh, he leads the research group EMC3 at the Salamanca University. So what does the three stand for? Um, this is um, the science, uh, climate change. So that's, uh, well, in Spanish is C. So there is three C's in the name. So yeah, okay. it comes from. So science of climate change, and also he is quite active on Twitter. So we both do some trolling online, no, not trolling, but we can be active online. So do feel free to follow him. Uh, he posts a lot about climate change and this is something that actually uh, affects a lot of people. And today, as we all know, phases are very important. A lot of things in our field are about phases. So. He is going to talk about extracting the phase from an electron wave packet. So Camilo, do feel free to start. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. So I will try to just uh, put the presentation online. So can you see it? Absolutely. Okay, perfect. So first of all, uh, let me thank Carla and all the team in UCL and the people organizing this, this seminar as well as the, the conference last year. It was really, really nice being in the middle of the pandemic and, and being able to attend a, a nice conference and, and see everybody. And also it was very nice to have this resource of, uh, of getting to know the state of the art of this field by, by looking this this YouTube uh, videos that, that they have, have, have produced from, from this seminar. So it has been a, a very interesting experience to, to see these this seminars and, and I have followed it. So today, what I want to talk this, uh, is about this, this problem, extracting the phase from an electron wave packet. So what I will do is, is the following. I will, uh, this, this, this seminar is about some ideas and concepts that we try to put together to discuss about how to extract the, 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 the phase of, the, of an electron wave function. Uh, we know that all the information in a system is contained in the wave function. So if we manage somehow to extract the amplitude and phase of this wave function, we will be able to access all the information from the system. So, but that is sometimes hard. But in metrology, in laser metrology, people have tried this, this problem already for a long time. And people, uh, what that what they do in order to characterize the, the the laser pulses, they try to extract the amplitude and phase uh, of these uh, uh, laser pulses, and with this they characterize it on time. So this is uh, we can extract some ideas from from that field and try to use it in the attosecond or the electrons. And in particular, in, in the metrology of XUV, what happens is that you need to create an electron wave packet with the XUV and then to somehow measure the phase of this electron wave packet and from there extract information about the XUV. So already the metrology of XUV pulses uh, makes use of, of this, uh, of, of measuring the, the electron wave packet. So this is, this is our concepts that we have developed over the years on uh, about, around this idea. 
And the outline of my talk is, is this. I want to discuss these three topics. The first one is the measuring of the carry envelope phase uh, with a short uh, IR laser pulse. The second one is an idea that we have about how to build an interferometer to, me to measure this electron wave packet and using the ideas of these animals that are used in the, in the laser community to measure short laser pulses. And finally, the, one, uh, the, the last topic that I want to discuss today is how we can measure not the carrier envelope phase of an IR, IR pulse, which has already been done uh, routinely in labs, but how to do that for a nanosecond pulse. So this is the, the, the idea. So the first one is, is measuring the carrier envelope phase of an IR pulse. So the definition of this carrier envelope phase is the following. Normally, if we have this very short laser pulse, we can define this carrier envelope phase as the, as the phase that exists between the envelope and the carrier in a short laser pulse. And uh, for example, to characterize these uh, short laser pulses, what people do is use these devices, for example, this frog, which is something like this. And these frog devices, what they do is they characterize uh, in, in, uh, in time and in, in frequency, the amplitude and phase of the envelope. Yeah? So by using this, these devices, you can access to the amplitude and phase of the envelope of the laser pulse. And from this, you can see how, if it's short or if it's long, uh, or what are the properties of this laser pulse. But they do not, this, this, these uh, techniques, they do not have access to the carrier envelope phase. So you can only tell about the, the envelope. So what we want to know is about the carrier envelope phase and why this, this one is important. <clears throat> this, this phase is important because, for example, in, in atom second physics is, is very important. The recollision uh, phenomena is all based on, on what is exactly the, uh, the carrier of these pulses. If you have different carrier envelope phases, you will produce, for example, different uh, high harmonic generation uh, spectrum. And this means that the attosecond structure that you will produce or the number of attosecond pulses in a train will depend on this carrier envelope phase. So it is important to fix this carrier envelope phase and to characterize this carrier envelope phase. So how does people uh, characterize this or measure this carrier envelope phase? So the idea is the following, is using the fact that uh, there is uh, this phenomenon called above threshold ionization um, that is, uh, that can uh, is sensitive to the carrier envelope phase. So if you manage to have a fixed carrier envelope phase and you can change this carrier envelope phase and then you uh, shine it over uh, some atom uh, and measure the electron, you will see that the electron spectrum, it looks like this. And if you look at it from uh, two different sides, you will see that the electron spectrum is different from either side. And this, is, this just changes with the carrier envelope phase. So this is the way, um, this is the, the phenomenon that is used to measure this carrier envelope phase. And the process is the following. So this is, a, this is a idea was introduced by Paulus already some time ago. And the idea is that you have this, this uh, atom somewhere here, you shine it with the, uh, with the carrier envelope phase uh, fixed uh, laser, and then you will have two, um, two time of flights. So one to the left and one to the right. And then for, you will try this experiment for different carrier envelope phase, for example, these two one here. So these time of flight tubes will measure different uh, times of arrival of electrons. The red uh, will be what is measured in, in one of the, of the uh, time of flight and the blue will be the other one. From this, you can extract energy of the electrons to one side or the other, and you can identify different regions. For example, the low energy region and the high energy region and you can do what is called the asymmetry parameter. So how much electrons are in the left in the energy, high energy region versus how many are in the, in, the, in the other side. And by doing this asymmetry parameter, you end up with these two curves here. And these two curves depend on the carrier envelope phase as you see here. And if you plot, let's say the, the green uh, values against the, the, uh, these other values here, what you will obtain is, this is what is called a potato. And this potato is telling you that for different carrier envelope phase, you will have these different asymmetry parameters. So this is, this is very interesting because it's a good way to characterize the carrier envelope phase uh, for this. And the last thing that you need to do is to label these phases. So you have to put, let's say, for example, this point and say this, this corresponds to such particular uh, carrier envelope phase. And what you do then is to use some theory and say, I will put together the, the same poles, the same amplitudes, the same um, field strength and so on. And with the phase, you will have knowledge of the absolute phases and you will be able to label this one. 
Uh, but this is normally, for example, done with uh, uh, strong field approximations. And you know that in strong field approximation, you made some assumptions about the phases of the electrons in the continuum. And what I would like to show you is what happens uh, if you use the exact scattering waves for this, for this process. So what you see here is, is a picture of the time dependent Schrodinger equation. And this is what you see is, is a pulse. And this is how the uh, wave function evolves over time when the laser pulse is done. And what we do is we wait at the end of the laser pulse. And at this point, we extract the, the, uh, the momentum distribution by projecting over, for example, plane waves in one case, and the other one is scattering waves. And this is the, what we obtain. We see that there is an asymmetry. Something different uh, happens in positive values and something different happens in negative values. But also there is a difference between using plane waves and using the real scattering waves. The spectrum are slightly different. Now, the momentum distribution are slightly different. And if we use this, uh, uh, these two types of uh, waves to, to, to measure the current envelope phase, we just uh, do the process that I just told you before. So for example, at first you measure what is the momentum distribution for the left and the right for all possible scattering envelope phases like this. And you do it for these scattering waves and the plane waves. And then you, with this, you can put together this potato. Uh, whoops, yes, and you can, uh, do uh, find this, this this potato that you see here. This is by choosing these regions in the spectrum. And interestingly enough, for the scattering wave and the plane waves, there is a shift. If I look closely into this region, it will be that um, the late bills that I have to put, they are a little bit uh, shifted. This means that there is exist an offset uh, when you use different uh, electron waves to project what you end up is with an offset on the definition of the carrier envelope phase. And this happens again uh, with, for example, with uh, longer wavelengths, this effect is more visible where you have uh, 1200 uh, nanometers as a driver laser, this shift will occur and it will be, uh, be larger. And if you do it at two microns, again, if you compare what you obtain with uh, scattering waves and with plane waves, it will be different. Uh, you will see that there is a slight shift between the, where the labels are located. So the conclusion from this part is that the choosing which uh, um, scattering waves that you are using to characterize your, for example, the current envelope phase or your pulse is important because if you use one or the other, you will have one error. You will have one shift uh, into in the determination of this current envelope phase. So it's, it's one example of, of the importance of, of, these, uh, of these phases in the, in the electron uh, functions that we use to project to obtain these momentum distributions. So this is, was uh, that was, was an example where the phase where the kind of uh, um, electron uh, waves that you use to project is important. And the second example I want to discuss is how you can measure the the phase of an electron wave packet using an interferogram. And as you as you see, for example, when you have an attosecond pulse, this is what is drawn here. You uh, will ionize an, an electron from an atom, for example. And this means that you will populate several different final, uh, uh, several states with final energies with, with different final energies. This is different, for example, the photoelectric effect where you only have one fixed uh, frequency in your driver and then you are with a final uh, momentum for final energy. In this case, what you have is, is a lot of uh, frequencies in your poles and all of them populates different energies. The process is, is defined by, by, by this equation. This equation tells you what is the probability of ending with a uh, final momentum P and depends of the dipole of the atom, depends also on the XUV poles of course, and it depends also in some other phases that, that uh, describes this, this ionization process. To characterize, to characterize these sex UV pulses, what people do, or one of the things that you can do is do this, uh, what is called the streaking trace and is to do the ionization process in the presence of a weak infrared laser and then delay the two pulses, the XUV against the IR. And if you do that, then if you measure the momentum spectrum, you will get this, this trace, this is streaking trace. And from this streaking trace, this is something interesting. You can identify the structure of a, of a frog, the frog that is used to characterize uh, short laser pulses. And you can identify the same structure in the equation that describes these ionizations in the presence of, uh, of a laser field, of a laser pulse. Basically, you can identify that there is some uh, signal that you want to, to discover, the atosecond pulse. 
this phase that appears here, is, it works as a phase gate. And this other term, what it does is you obtain the spectrum of this, this thing. So this uh, formally is like a frog equation and you can use the, the methods of the retrieval algorithms to identify the XUV uh, time dependence or the structure in time of this XUV. And also you obtain this, this uh, vector potential of the IR that you are using to, to do this. Um, so this is how metrology on uh, short of the second pulses is, is done. And what we try to do is, is the following. There is another um, animal that is used to characterize uh, short laser pulses, which is called uh, SPIDER, spectral phase interferometry for direct, uh, direct electric field reconstruction. This is used for measuring short uh, laser pulses. And what we have done is to try to just do uh, something which is similar, but in this case, we call it Q-SPIDER. And the idea is now to characterize electron wave patterns. And so how does it work? So the usual spider, it works like this. What you have to do is this is the pulse that you want to characterize. Then you have to go through a beam splitter. You have to have two delay copies. And in one of the copies, you introduce a frequency share. Somehow you can manage to, to, to do this frequency share. And then you make them interfere again. And what will you obtain the, the spectrum yeah, of, these, uh, of these two pulses? It will look something like that. This interferogram contains the information about the amplitude, for example, here, but also contains some information about the, the phase, the spectral phase of this pulse. And this means that it can be reconstructed. And this is how, by getting the amplitude and the spectral phase, you can reconstruct these, these pulses with the spider. So the idea that we have is that to, to do the same thing, but now do it with attosecond pulses and electron wave packets. So the idea now is that we want to characterize an electron wave packet using this scheme. So how this is done. So the, the recipe, what it needs is needs two copies of the electron wave packet, needs that they have uh, to have some delay between them and they also need to be, have some, uh, some share between them. And how you do that? For example, if you have two attosecond pulses separated by some delay between them and you do, um, you ionize an atom in the presence of a weak IR field uh, in such a way that the, the, at the time when one attosecond is ionized and you have one value for the vector potential, and, and at the time where the other one, you have a different value. What you will obtain is, is two copies of the of the of an electron wave uh, pulse, which are identical except that they are, have a time difference, and they have uh, slightly different streaks. So these two will interfere, and they will produce an interferogram. So an interferogram in momentum space, and you can use exactly the same tools of the spider to retrieve the amplitude and and the phase, but now in this case of an electron wave pack. So it looks like this, for example, in this case, this guy, it will not be a streak because the, the value of the momentum vector is almost zero here. And in this other case, it will have some streaking. And this relative streaking will produce, will be used to, to do the retrieval. This is how it looks, these two um, electron wave packets in, 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 in positions. This is how it looks in momentum, what you will see in experiment. And you can use the same uh, tricks, the retrieval tricks to, to obtain the, the, uh, the amplitude and the phases of this. So how does it work formally? So this formula that you see here, this is the formula of how uh, of the ionization of uh, by an second in the presence of IR. And you can think of this as having an amplitude and one phase. And the amplitude is basically given by the product of the dipole and the, and the spectrum of the XUV. That's the amplitude. And then in the phase, you have several components. You have the, the dipole phase, you have another which is atomic, the other one which is the bulk of phase, and you also have the phases coming from the XUV pulse itself. If you do now two uh, identical attosecond pulses, that you will have just the sum of the two of these, and then you will have these terms, and one term which is the interference between these two, and the relative phase will be, will be appear here. So you will be able to have, again, these phases, but now these phases, for example, the bulk of phase is evaluated between these two poses. So most of these phases, for example, if you know the attosecond uh, phases, you can remove them, or this just you can also very, very easily calculate, and then you will end up with just the, for example, uh, the phase of the dipole, in this case, the difference phase of the dipole. And, is, and if the relative streaking between the two copies is small, you can approximate it to the derivative of the phase, and with that, you can integrate the phase. You can retrieve this, this dipole phase, uh, which, is, which is very important. 
So this is a demonstration of how it works. So we have this, this, this pulse, we have these two attosecond uh, pulses. We use it, for example, in the first state, excited state of the helium ion. We do the simulation for this process. We obtain an interferogram. We use the tools of the attosecond uh, retrieval and we obtain the, the amplitude here in blue, uh, which is exactly as the, the theoretical one, the amplitude and the spectral phase of the electron wave packet. And if we know the information about the XUV, we can divide by that information and obtain uh, the amplitude of the dipole and the phase of the dipole, which is really nice because they, they compare very good one, one to each other. You can do this in the case of, uh, um, for example, uh, that case we did it with a short range potential. You can also do it with a long range potential and it, it works well. This is the case for using the time Schrodinger equation, the time dependent Schrodinger equation. And you again use these two at the second pulses in the presence of an IR. And uh, by doing this process, you, you can obtain very, uh, very nicely the amplitude of the electron wave packet and the phase of the electron wave packet. And it compares very well to the phase. So it's nice because it's an interferogram. It's, it's a replication of the cusp of the spider, but now to characterize electron wave packet. And it works well. We can extend a little bit more this idea. And for example, there is this technique which is called um, wavefront uh, interferometer to, to characterize the wavefront of some uh, pulse of light. And what it does is this, there is this, uh, this uh, piece of material. What it does is it does replicas of the same pulse that is coming here and is sharing these replicas into different directions. And then all of these replicas, they interfere with each other. So we can use this idea again and try to do the following. So we can try to streak the, the electrons in, in our case, not only in one direction, but in two directions. For example, if the polarization of the probe field, the streaking field is in one direction, we will have such a streaking, uh, such an interference image. And by isolating this, we can extract the, the, the amplitude and phase in one direction. But if we manage to do the, the streaking in, in, in other direction, in other axis, we can obtain another, uh, another interferogram and obtain the amplitude and phase of the dipole, for example, but now in a different direction. And we do this uh, in the following way. For example, here you see uh, two copies of the attosecond pulses. And now this time the streaking field is circularly polarized which means that at some point you will have a streaking only in the y direction. And if you change the delay between the two pulses and the IR, uh, you can have the streaking in the other direction. So you will have something like this. This is the case, for example, where you have only streaking in the y direction because this pulse is here. The other one doesn't have a streaking. So you are creating two copies and a streaking in the y direction. If you change the delay, for example, to have one at a second pulse here or the other one somewhere here, you can have the streaking in the other direction. This means that you can reconstruct the amplitude and phase of the, uh, of the electrons, not only in, one, in the polarization direction, but try to get the two of them. And this is one example. This is the exact dipole amplitude that we have put into the simulations of the TDSC. And after the process that I have described, we obtain this is the retrieved dipole amplitude. And you can see that within this momentum region that is defined by the spectrum of the XUV, the, the agreement is very nice. You can retrieve really the, the dipole amplitude. And also you can retrieve the, the, the partial derivatives of the phase with respect different directions. And then you can put them together and retrieve the, the dipole phase, let's say in a plane, in this planes PY and PX. And this compares very nicely to, the, to, to what is expected. So this is uh, one idea. This is how we use the idea of the, the spider optical technique and try to put it together, but now in the, to characterize electron wave packet. Um, so yes, yeah, so the next topic that I want to discuss is, is the following, is, the, is how to use these measurements of the dipole phase, but now in, in molecules that, that, that are particular. So molecules which are asymmetric. And, and this is something which is, we believe that is interesting. So, you know, uh, there has been a lot of uh, activity in this topic of delay on photoemission. So measuring um, how much does it take to the electron to leave the, the ion when it's ionized by an attosecond pulse. Um, it's also called Wigner time. 
um, and has been studied already in, in atoms and in molecules in, in detail. And uh, you can define this Wigner time in the following way. You can define it as the derivative of the phase of the dipole. The dipole is, this is the, the dipole that is responsible for the ionization of the electron with the laser, with the XGB pulse. So the idea is that if you manage to uh, extract this, this, this phase of the dipole, you will be able to, to in principle, obtain this big nerve time. So, but there is a problem that in most of the experiments that, that are trying to do this, what you measure, this part is what you measure in the experiment, is not only the Wigner, uh, the Wigner time, but it's also the, um, contains uh, some other contributions. For example, the group delay, the long range contribution, what is called the continuum continuum coupling, and sometimes even polarization if you are dealing with molecules. So the problem here is that you want to dis extract this Wigner time, but for doing that, you need to have knowledge on all of these terms in order that from your measurement, you can end up with, the, with just say, let's the Wigner time. So the idea that we have in order to be able to remove at least some of these contributions and be able to access this one with more details is try to study um, just uh, some systems of this kind. So uh, molecules where there is asymmetry, so that the, let's say there are different atoms to one side and they are in other times. And the idea that we have is that we could study the Wigner delay in one direction and compare it to the Wigner delay in the other direction. And this is very similar to the idea that I mentioned before that the stereo ATI. So this is why we call it stereo Wigner time delay. So what we'll do is compare how much it takes the electron to reach one side against how much it takes to the other side. Of course, it works only on asymmetric uh, systems, but it has some advantages. For example, one advantage is, is that it can remove the long range contribution, which sometimes is hard to, to, to extract. For example, the, the Coulomb Coulomb correction, you can uh, remove it just by uh, subtracting one with the other. Uh, and also, for example, you can study only one orbital. In most of the studies of the delay in photomission, you need to study at least two orbitals and compare the delay between these two orbitals. In this case, you could study only one orbital. So we tried to, to think about this one and we started using a very, very simple uh, system, a model, a 1D model for the uh, CO molecule. So an oxygen on one side and carbon on the other side. And if you do this very simple model, you can extract, for example, this is the, you can extract the, 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 the phase, you can calculate it directly. So that will be the amplitude. The amplitude, I don't know if it, you can see it, but this is slightly different to one side to the other. The phase is, is much more different to one side to the other. And we compare it with the hydrogen because the hydrogen, it, it's the dipole amplitude is the same for both sides and the dipole uh, other phases is just one, one phase. And we try to test this idea. Let's say we calculate this, this Wigner time this, uh, and calculate it to one side. For example, in hydrogen, it will look like that as a function of the energy of the electron. And if you, in hydrogen, because a symmetric system, if you subtract one versus the other, you will obtain zero. This is what you expect, just zero. There is no difference between how, does, how long does it take the electron to one, from one side to the other. But if you do it in CO, you will obtain that from the left is this green line. And from the right is this blue line. And then you will have some difference, which is here in red. And something interesting is that, and here you can remove this, this long contribution, uh, this contribution to this measured uh, time. So that means that you are already uh, making use of, of this technique. Uh, the stereo will remove this contribution and then you will have access only to the, to the difference of, of, of to the stereo Wigner time. We try to test this with another thought experiment and this thought experiment goes like this. So you have, for example, an atom and a hydrogen, and this is a space and this is time. And then what you do is just ionize with another second pulse and you follow the two electrons that come in into two directions. And you see how much time it will take to reach two, uh, two detectors with two thought detectors that we put at some distance. And of course, in the hydrogen, the two, parts of the electron will reach these detectors at the same time if they are at the same distance. But in the case of CO, um, it will take less time for going to one side than, and than the other electron to go into the other side. We can see this delay. And if we measure this delay, it, it coincides exactly with what, what is expected from the, uh, from the information from the, from the dipole. So this is interesting. This, could, uh, this is a good way to, come, to test that by doing this, you, you have access to the Wigner time. 
But the problem is that these kind of experiments cannot be done in the experiments. You cannot just put two things there and see when the electrons come. So the experiment that can be done in the lab is something like this. If you can do the streaking, but now in the streaking, what we are doing is looking at how the streaking trace is looking for the electrons going to the left and the electrons going to the right. And in the case of the hydrogen, what you will see is that this, for example, this red curve that you see here, this is the vector potential. And this is the, the center of mass of this streak trace. And there is a delay, but the delay is the same for the left and the right. This is what is expected. But in the case of the CO, if you look what happens to the left and to the right, then you will see that the red is the vector potential. And then the center of mass of these two traces, it will follow them. But what will happen is that while in the case of hydrogen, the delay is the same for the two sides, in the case of the CO is different from, from the two sides. So it's interesting because it means that with the streaking trace, you, you, you can have access to, to this one. Okay. Okay, so that was nice because this, this simple model in 1D allows us to say, okay, you can access to, to measure this Wigner time delay. It, what you access is exactly that. Um, and you can remove contribution, for example, this laser, coupling, color, uh, laser coulomb coupling, which some, is sometimes a problem when you want to strike. And it's robust, so you can use a lot of parameters of the XUV and the IR, and it works uh, in, in all of the types. So we said, okay, so this is nice. Let's try to do something a bit more um, realistic. For example, a model of a 3D model of this molecule. And we did uh, a model for the 3D CO using the TDSE. We tried to first start with the HOMO uh, orbital. And then we tried to test this idea whether we will able to see the difference between going to one side and the other. And what happened was the following. Um, this is how it looks. Uh, for example, when you apply just the single atom second, you will see that one part remains uh, bounded and the other one is flies away. So are ionized electrons. This is the momentum distributions of those electrons. And what we want to do is just to analyze two opposite directions and see what is the difference between these, these opposite directions. And we again do this uh, thought experiment of just placing some detectors at some point far away from the from this atom and see how much time does it take the electrons to reach those uh, those imaginary detectors. And what happens is here that you can follow these, these electrons going to this uh, detector and one of them reach slightly later than the other. So it, it, it's actually the case that they are not, uh, they take uh, longer time in one side than the other. And you can obtain this, this Wigner time or stereo Wigner time. And then you can do this for all the energies. And this is what you get. This, is, uh, this will be the stereo Wigner time for different energies. And again, this, this experiment you cannot do. You can only do in theory. But we thought, well, we will try to just do the streaking and see if, if this uh, just show the same result. So we do the streaking. And for example, we do this for this, uh, ex, uh, this frequency, 2.5 atomic units. And we have, uh, the first thing we see is that the, the streaking is different from the electrons going to the left and to the right. And this is okay, as expected. But then we saw some features here where we didn't expect any. We just expect that if, if there's, the pulse is already gone, you should not see any deformations. And we see it for different uh, XUV energies, which means that something was happening by when applying the, the striking technique just to, to make sure that this was working. And so when we try to compare the vector potential, the black against the left and right, we obtain very strange uh, curves here. So, so something was wrong. So the idea is that when we use the top technique, we obtain this blue curve here. But then we, when we are, we're using the streaking IR, we obtain different Wigner, uh, stereo Wigner time. So something was wrong. They should be on top of each other. They should just show the same, one being more realistic to the experiment, but they should be the same. So there was something more going. So we try to do uh, some tests. And for example, the first thing that we do did is just try another orbital, not the HOMO, but try another one. So we did that and the streaking traces already look normal, let's say here. And then we compared what happens with the top and the streaking and they were given the same, uh, the same result. So, so some other orbitals were working as we expected. And then again, what we did is was we tried with the HOMO again, but now we are different uh, streaking wavelength, 200 nanometers. And again, everything was working well. The top was matching with the streaking result. So the conclusion was that the IR was doing something. Even it was very weak, it was doing something to our system so that the streaking was not working. And what happened was the following. 
uh, we track the population of the LUMU, that's the, the next orbital to the HOMO. And what we found is that when we were applying this weak infrared orbital, uh, sorry, weak infrared probe field as a streaking uh, field, what we saw is that the, the, the HOMO was losing a lot of uh, population and the LUMO was gaining uh, population. This is because the, the energy gap is very close to the, to the energy of the photons of the IR. This means that we were transferring population in a resonant fashion, and this was very efficient. And even if we had a very low intensities, we already managed to, get, to have a lot of population in the, in the, in the LUMO. So what was happening is, is that instead of being just a probe field, this tricking field, it was already doing something. It was populating something uh, in higher orbitals. And what did that is was distorting all the streaking orbitals. So, so the streak, we have to be very careful because this can happen in molecular orbitals. All of these gaps between HOMO and LUMO, they have uh, ener energy gaps uh, similar to the IR fields that we are using. But not, not everything was bad because what happens is that if you follow the streaking trees, the left and right somewhere here at the end, there is some remaining oscillations that does not occur normally. But the interesting thing is that this oscillation has a frequency which is related to the gap between the OMO and LUMO. This is, this is well known. We have created an, uh, an electron wave, wave packet between the OMO and LUMO, and they, are, uh, they have these Rabi oscillations. And we, we are testing this Rabi oscillation with the antisecond pulse that is, is happening here. And it's, it's even more. We can, we, because we can just fit this, this, uh, this curve here to what we see in the, in the streaking traces. This means that in principle, uh, we could reconstruct the electron wave packet, which is produced in the superposition of the OMO LUMO inside the molecule and, ex and reconstruct exactly this wave packet with the information that we obtain in the trace. So, okay, so this means only that uh, when you do this more, uh, more realistic uh, simulation, well, things sometimes get a bit more complicated. And um, the last thing I want to say about this stereo Wigner time delay is that this idea has already been used in the experiments. For example, this paper by the group of Ursula, Ursula Keller in, uh, in Zurich have tried these experiments and they have tried to use GO in different orientations and try exactly do this with the rabbit technique. And they have found that indeed you can obtain differences. Uh, for example, in this case, when the, the polar, when the axis of the molecule is perpendicular to the polarization axis, you can see there is this stereo Wigner time, which, and, and this is very interesting because it gives you some insight into the inner part of the, of the inner uh, details of how the ionization process has occurred. These are my, my conclusions. So the first one is that the problem of extracting the amplitude and phase of an electron wave packet is the same problem that is being used to characterize uh, short laser pulses or short at second pulses. And it will be nice to have uh, ways to, to, to do replicas of these animals. For, for example, the spider and the Q spider, or maybe some other animals that people invent for characterizing pulses, use them to, to, um, to characterize electron wave packets. I have shown you that it is important uh, to do metrology of this carrier envelope pacing with the IR to use exactly the scattering waves to have the right offset for your measurement. I also discussed that the Q spider is, is a good way to retrieve the amplitude and phase, for example, the dipole of the, of the system. And this can be done um, using this interferometer, which is simple to understand. And the other concept that we, discuss uh, with these ideas is how to measure this stereo Wigner time delay. So what are the difference between the time that it takes to ionize in, a, um, in an asymmetric molecule when the electron is going to one side and the other? And this has advantages because it allows you to, to remove some terms which are hard to, to calculate when you want to access the, the Wigner time. Um, so, so yeah, this is the conclusions of my talk. And, I just want to end up um, acknowledge, uh, acknowledging my, my colleagues uh, that uh, work together with me to do these, these ideas. Alexis, which is in, in Korea, Manfred Lein, which is in Hannover, and Feng He and his student, which is in Yautong University. And thank you very much for your, your attention. Thank you uh, pretty much for your talk. Uh, it was really nice. Please put your questions in the Q&A. I can see already some coming. 
Now, before we start, I would like to make a few advertisements. First is that the European Physical Journal D has agreed with regard to our special issue to extend the deadline until the end of the year. So if you still would like to contribute to the special issue quantum aspects of auto science, uh, do feel free, please feel free to do so and let us know. And the second announcement is that for 2022, we want to start contributed sessions, which will be delivered by early career researchers. So if you have a postdoc or if you have a PhD student and this person would like to talk in the Art of Fridays in 2022, uh, please uh, go to our website, look at hot topic session and you're going to find the instructions of how to apply. We are going to uh, select contributions in January. So please do so until the end of the year. And uh, we are very excited uh, to hear from your work. And we think in these difficult times, it's really impo important to uh, give space to people who are postdocs or people who are PhD students and have something nice and uh, important to talk about and something hot, because it's the hot topic session. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's start with the questions. The first one is by Mohammed Hassan. Very nice talk. I think determining the delay response of the system beside the CAP determination would be very interesting. Is there a generic way to extract the delay response from the spectral modulation with the CAP? Okay, um, thank you very much for the question, but uh, I, am, I am not really sure if I understand it correctly. So, in the case of, um, uh, if, if, if we are discussing the, the carryable phase of, the, of an IR, I think uh, what you can obtain is, as, as I mentioned, this is the, the procedure to, to measure this carryable phase. And the whole idea of what I discussed is that um, if you, that you have to use the scattering waves or the real scattering waves to obtain the exact carryable phase. If you use another, uh, continuous wave, for example, the plane wave, what will happen is that you will obtain the potato, you will obtain, let's say, the, um, the, qua the qualitative agreement of, of what is, is done, but you will not measure the exact carryable phase. You will have this, this shift, and in order to, to remove that shift, you need to do the experiment with the revised scattering phases. But um, I don't know, maybe if you can explain a little bit more, I can... So what I mean by that is the uh, measured CEP from the potato may be already shifted due to the uh, electronic delay response of the system. So is there a way to reference the place to the exact uh, waveform of the field by whatever, and then get a generic way to determine the electronic delay response in any uh, system under study? Yes, I mean, I think uh, my response will be that, in a way that the um, after the interaction with the IR with a fixed carrier envelope phase, what you will obtain is an electron going traveling to the left and to the right, and the properties of these electron uh, electrons that move in these two directions, they have two informations contained. One of them is about the the dipole, uh, which is basically the response of the atom to the to the to the ionizing field. And the other one is the details of the of the IR. So if you manage to to, for example, put in the information of the IR that you have measured, for example, with the frog, then what remains there is the is the response of the of the of the atom. And in, in this sense, that it will be, for example, delay if you if you have if the shape of the of of the dipole phase is it has some some something strange that will be seen as a delay in the response. So, so yes, in principle, um, it, it's very similar to the Wigner delay, but now in the case of the, the above thresholdization with uh, IR. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm muted. Okay, would you like to ask further or that is, is that fine? No, no, it's absolutely fine. That's it, thank you so much. 
Thank you. So we have someone else. Uh, we have uh, Ritupa asking, hi, can you please briefly explain apocycline streaking? Ritupana Das, sorry. Sorry, I was just seeing the first part of your name. It's Ritupana Das. Uh, I correct myself, apologize for mispronouncing your name. Would you like to uh, explain uh, atocycline streaking, Camilo, please? So the idea is the following. If you have an XUV, something like this, this will ionize the electron by single photon absorption. And then the electron spectrum that you will observe, for example, in momentum space, it will look like this. It will be centered at some position, which is given by the conservation of energy. And it will, has, it will have a width, which is related to the spectral width of this. But now, if you do the same process, but now the ionization takes place in the presence of a weak IR field, then what will happen is that depending on, on the value of the vector potential of this IR field, this, uh, what you will observe is the same momentum distribution, but this time it will be shifted. And it will be shifted exactly by the minus value of the vector potential at that time. And if you continue to just uh, accumulating all the possible delays that you have, you will end up having something like this. This is a trace. So for uh, the delay, let's say, for some delay, you will have just the momentum distribution. And as you move along the, the vector potential, uh, the momentum distribution will be shifted up and down, and you will produce this, this trace. And this trace, uh, from this information, you can extract the information about the duration of the XUV pulse and the, the IR field. Would you like to ask further? Uh, uh, no, no, that's all. Uh, thank you for explaining. It was a very nice talk. Thank you very much. We also have a question from Diego Abo. Nice talk, Camilo. For spider, you use a Volkov state in your calculations, which is perfect for short range potential. What about a long range potential? Do you use something more sophisticated than the Volkov phase? Um, yes. Um, so thank you, Diego. This is also a question from, uh, Diego is from Argentina, so, and also is an expert on this one, so it's, it's nice. So, yeah, so yeah, there is the, yeah, the, the, to having the right scattering wave is, is, is very difficult. So the answer is the following. Uh, for the 1D case, we can have uh, the true scattering wave. So really the, uh, so the correct uh, wave functions, and, and we can use that and include, for example, problems with long range potential, and we're able to extract the, um, the the dipole phase very very efficiently. But in the one D, in the case of three D, we don't use plane waves. We use the equivalent of, of plane waves. What we do is we do the simulations in cylindrical uh, symmetry, and so our plane waves is a is a product of Bessel functions times Hankel functions. Mm -hmm. But this is the equivalent of of uh, plane waves in this space. So. Um, so yeah, the, the answer is like this. So in 1D, we can use uh, the real thing, uh, more sophisticated than Vulcan waves. In the 3D case where you use cylindrical, uh, we, we only use the, the equivalent of plane waves. And, and we would like, I mean, Diego, if you, if you have some way to, to do this efficiently, the, to have uh, these scattering waves, it, that will be very nice. Okay, thank you, Camilo, and nice to see you again after one decade, more or less. <laughs> and I think also Carla is uh, an expert on this so subject. <laughs> thank you. Uh, two further announcements. Uh, we were asked about the link to the special issue. So we put the link in uh, the chat session. And also for your information, I'm going to put the link of the hot topics so that you can see the instructions of how to apply. What you need to do is you write an email to uh, quantumbattles.gmail.com and you explain why you should talk, provide a short abstract, a link to the paper you would like to talk about, uh, state your name and your affiliation and career stage and use as subject hot topics so uh, that we know uh, what you're applying for. And it would be great 
to have uh, early career sessions in 2022. We're looking forward uh, to your applications, those watching. So people on YouTube, thank you so much for joining. Have a great weekend. And wherever you are, thank you for watching. Take good care of yourselves.